All right. Well, afternoon. I hope to uh, keep you entertained for the next hour or so. I know I'm the last thing in between you and uh, whatever you have planned for this evening. Um, just to double down, uh, thank you, Chuck, for having myself as well as my colleague Jackie here. Uh, the last three years before I joined Every Town, I was a special assistant in the Office of Public Safety. In addition to working with Chuck on Give, I also drafted a number of model policies. Some of you may be utilizing them, uh, interviewing juveniles in custody, the usage of uh, drones, things of that nature. So I definitely enjoyed my uh, experience there, and I was happy to contribute. Before that, I was a prosecutor in Queens County uh, for approximately eight years, where I did a mixed bag of domestic violence as well as organized tax evasion. Now at every town, I manage a very nimble team focused on implementing non-legislative strategies, uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of those today. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Pitt. Um, I'm also an attorney. My background is originally in federal litigation, but I moved into domestic violence the past six or so years both um, representing clients, doing legislative work with state governments, and more recently working to implement those laws, um, particularly focusing in on courts and um, you know, judicial practice in terms of exercise of uh, discretion in those cases. Okay, so a quick forecast of what we'll talk with you about today. First, we're going to give a rundown of gun violence in America and dive into that in a little more detail. Um, we want to talk about the impact of evidence-based strategies, specifically at the city, at the city level. We'll talk to you about state and local gun violence prevention initiatives, non-legislative initiatives that we've seen really reduce gun violence in those locations. Um, and then look at the intersection between government and nonprofits, how um, law enforcement agencies, government agencies, and organizations like ours can really work together to um, you know, really shift things here. So we'll try to keep the research element brief. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, we'll discuss briefly how gun violence is being experienced and articulated across the nation. A couple big points. One, we know that the majority of gun violence happens in cities. In fact, we know that more than half of the gun-related homicides occur in only 127 cities. And in fact, 50 of those 127 account for one in three firearm-related homicides. Additionally, we know that all cities are not equal. There are some that are safer than others. And in fact, in specific cities, folks are even uh, more exposed to the gun violence. In Jackson, Mississippi, for instance, folks are nine times more likely than the average American to be impacted by gun violence. Uh, in New Orleans, it's 11 times. But additionally, when you look at specific cities, you'll find that gun violence is not endemic across those cities, right? They are concentrated in the communities that are easily identifiable. These are communities that have been racially segregated, that have dense population, that have low educational attainment, little access to opportunity. These are the areas that are primarily and disproportionately impacted by the violence. And the demographics of those communities, or rather those clustered communities, are very consistent across the nation. They're primarily black people that live in these communities within cities that are disproportionately impacted. Uh, additionally, we know that non-fatal shootings are a larger part of the gun violence problem. On average, there are approximately six non-fatals for every gun-related homicide. In some cities, it's less. In some cities, it's more. Some data has shown that in San Francisco, it's five for every homicide. In Louisville, it's also five. But what you'll note in, those, in both of those cities is that the aggregate level is very different. In fact, Louisville has about twice as many homicides, but they're still experiencing non-fatal shootings at the same rate. Okay, so I know there's some people at the back, and this is a graph with small writing on it, so let me just describe what you're seeing in front of you. This is 60 years' worth of data about the murder rate in America, and it's split into two categories. The yellow line is the national murder rate, and that red line there is limited to just cities with more than 250,000 people. And you can see as you look at that, the homicide increased in some cities, and many communities continue to struggle, uh, but the crime remains at you know, close to a 30-year low. There were 24,703 homicides in 1991, with a homicide rate of around 27 people per 100,000 in cities. Uh, compare that now for 2017 was the most recent data. Um, it's around 17,000, so a dramatic decrease. And we know that if the 1991 murder rate had continued, around 200,000 more people would have been killed in that time period. So that means what we're doing collectively law enforcement as well as the community in concert has been working primarily for the last three decades. And the aggregate levels over that period have come down. But 
We are noticing in specific pockets within cities that the crime persists or even is increasing. And that does not throw this data out the window, but what that means is the way all of you do this work, focusing on the people and the places that are driving the violence, is the right way and it has been effective. So now we're going to talk about the impact of some of the non-legislative strategies or evidence-based strategies being implemented by many, if not all of you, uh, and talk about some of the impact they've been, ha they've been having across the nation. One, I think it's important to start with our framing and the framing that many of you probably utilize. Um, strategies can fall in a number of buckets. Long-term prevention, that's identifying the individuals who are mo most likely to be impacted by violence or to pick up a gun and working with them uh, to prevent that from ever happening. Perhaps that's changing behaviors, the way they process information, the way they handle disputes, the way they all, uh, may even mediate between their friends and family to de-escalate. Working in the long-term prevention bucket from a young age will hopefully reduce that exposure to violence. Intervention, we're talking about intervening into the flow of violence to stop it. We want the gun violence to stop. Obviously, in many instances or many communities, it's already raging. Identifying the individuals who are close to the nexus of violence and intervening, perhaps wrapping them in social services to help them identify a new path in life. And then immediate response. When the shootings continue, how do you immediately respond to prevent re-injury, retaliation? How do you reduce that harm so that others aren't impacted? How do you reduce that harm for witnesses, family members, and friends who are also impacted by the violence? And then reintegration. This is for both victims as well as offenders. How do you reintegrate them into the social fabric of your community to prevent them from re-injury, retaliation, or simply not finding their way back into society? This could include helping them find a job, giving them skills training, assisting them with taking care of their children, for instance. And of course, throughout this spectrum, there has to be accountability and transparency. And that's one of the beauties of the GIVE model, as well as the models that are popping up around the country, where there is proper oversight and transparency, there's data tracking and monitoring, as well as proper crime analysis to help inform those strategies being implemented across the spectrum to make sure they're data informed and locally informed. So, beginning at the beginning with long-term prevention. So these are the strategies and programs uh, that aim to address the long-range contributors to violence before violence even occurs. Um, you know, we know that these types of strategies may not yield what look like instant results, but they do result in the longer-term reduction in crime. Um, so one of the examples we have up there is um, community-driven crime prevention by environmental design. It's probably familiar to many of you. We'll, we'll call it SEPTED. Um, that's literally cleaning and greening, making spaces more um, uh, inviting and available to people, uh, and reducing the, um, you know, the really deadly nexus between blighted neighborhoods and blighted spaces, small spaces, and crime. Uh, we also have up there counseling and mentoring services for youth. And in particular, I wanted to call out um, summer sorry, summer employment programs. There's been some really great evidence coming out more recently about these. Um, probably all know by way of our own histories and upbringings that summer is a good time to um, get into trouble. Um, conversely, some of the um, employment programs are a really fantastic way to um, engage with youth who are at risk of having little to do in summer, um, but also of not having um, really easy access and pathways to long-term employment, to skill building, um, and to really be able to shape a future um, of their own. So, you know, some great projects like Project India out of Indianapolis. Um, we know there that in Indianapolis they're connecting um, literally hundreds of kids with summer employment opportunities. <coughs> FedEx alone has um, pledged 400 summer jobs. That's a really exciting project. The data also reflects, as many of you are also well aware, that there are more calls for service, more shootings in general that happen overnight and during summer months. So the data also reflects what uh, anecdotally we know from the field. Yeah, and then looking at cognitive behavioral therapy. That's probably a technique that many of you are familiar with. Um, in essence, if I was going to boil it right down, is teaching individuals to slow down, to stop, to think about and change their automatic responses. Um, we know there's really strong evidence that CBT helps children and teens to process trauma from witnessing and experiencing gun violence, it reduces post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and aggressive behaviors, helps develop better coping skills, uh, develops communication and conflict resolution skills, and changes the way that they interpret um, and respond to everyday situations. And there's been some really great uh, 
studies and evidence about this now. Um, in particular, the Becoming a Man program in Chicago has had a really excellent evaluation. Um, we know that it helps y uh, youth and young men in particular handle trauma and change their responses to different kinds of situations. Um, and there have been two randomized controlled trials of this by the University of Chicago Crime Lab. We see up here that across a number of evaluations of these programs, there's been a 45% reduction in violent crime arrests. It's an outstanding response, and we don't see that often in the, this kind of research, and a 10% increase in high school graduation. The Becoming a Man program in Chicago saw even better results. In fact, it saw um, high school graduation rates boosted by 20%. And a little bit more about Becoming a Man. Becoming a Man is a school-based intervention in Chicago public schools where they work to identify individuals who are likely to be involved in the violence. They provide them with a tailored uh, uh, syllabus as well as an after-school program where they come together, they talk about the trauma in their community, how to process it, how to deal with it, and they ideate on solutions that can be implemented in their, in, in their community. Moving on to intervention, as I mentioned before, these are the strategies that can intervene prior to the violence, hopefully to prevent it from ever happening. Emergency dispossession, we're talking about domestic violence restraining orders, which require the relinquishment of firearms. We're talking about removing the firearm from an individual who has posed a threat to a, a victim um, and possibly threaten that violence. We're talking about cure violence. We talked a bit about that earlier uh, in the Project Longevity presentation. Uh, cure violence is, or rather GVI, sorry, I'll get back to you. Cure violence is street outreach work. That's basically our snug program, right, uh, where credible messengers go into the community. They identify individuals who are likely to shoot or be shot. They provide them with social services. They try to prevent the violence. They also hit the streets as soon as they know violence is going to occur, and they try to prevent it from ever happening. And then GVI, based on David Kennedy's model, which I know many of you are familiar with. Uh, this is a mixture of the community and law enforcement giving a message of care and compassion uh, to individuals who have been identified as being close to the violence and a part of it. Similarly, they also, or rather simultaneously, they also provide social service wraparounds. They try to connect them with the agencies that can help them change their lives and stop the violence. A recent uh, evaluation of cure violence in the Bronx, where I know we have a snug team, has shown that cure violence has had a great effect. In fact, showing a 37% decline in gun injuries. But even more impressive, that same analysis found a 63% a decline in shootings. So this is having an effect. They're obviously getting to the right people. What this points to is the identification of the right people in the right places to target for this proper strategy. At the end of the day, none of these strategies that we're going to discuss or have discussed will work if they're not tailored to your community, your needs, your resources, the people in the places that drive your violence, as well as, and I know I led with this when we talked about the environments in which the violence happens, but also targeting those systemic or systematic uh, causes and policies that have created these environments in which this violence thrives. Yeah, so another policy area where we have real ability to intervene uh, very quickly before violence may occur is domestic violence. And we see that with domestic violence firearm relinquishment laws. Um, like here in New York State, there's a limited set of circumstances where an offender can be required to turn in a gun. Um, and evidence shows that these laws really work. We see um, that when states pass laws that require domestic violence offenders or um, persons who are subject to final domestic violence restraining orders to actually relinquish their guns once the order takes effect, you know, we see a 10 to 12% drop in overall intimate partner homicide rates um, and a 14 to 16% drop in firearm related rates, which also shows there's a very low, what we would say, in a replacement rate in terms of attempts or methods of killing, um, that really that removing the gun from these domestic violence situations is very effective. So next, we'll dig in briefly to the response side of this. So these are strategies or practices designed to improve the likelihood of survival community perceptions of safety, and the likelihood of accurately and swiftly identifying and intervening with the user of violence. So examples here are submitting every gun for tracing, bystander physical uh, trauma training, and submitting ballistics from shootings. So a great example of bystander training is in Philadelphia. Um, ER doctors at Temple University Hospital developed a bystander mm -hmm. training program. It's called Fighting Chance. So the idea is that bystanders can save lives, and the program teaches community members uh, how to do things like control bleeding, how to really um, respond in the moment uh, once violence has occurred. 
Many cities also deploy uh, support resources immediately after a shooting to help provide services and importantly to provide stabilization in a way that's trauma informed. So for example, in Milwaukee, the Salvation Army is sending in chaplains to the scene of every shooting to provide emotional and spiritual support to the community. And let's talk about something that probably all of you do regularly, uh, which is submitting your shell casings to NIBIN. I see our friends from ATF here, um, as well as tracing every crime gun. And there has been recent research that has shown by doing these tasks uniformly, you can increase. And in fact, a 27% increase in shooting links have been tied to usage, regular usage of NIBIN. Um, as of right now, only 11 states have NIBIN. Um, 19 states only have one or two terminals. Many locals are dependent on the ATF CJICs, their centralized uh, gun intel centers, to access this uh, information. But we recommend that every agency find a way to access uh, a NIBIN machine, as well as integrating tracing crime guns into your regular uh, uh, course of business. It is something that will allow you to bolster your future investigations, develop more data, so you can have more analysis and be more data informed when you're selecting your top offenders list, choosing your hot spots, and deploying your resources so you can do it in a strategic manner, as we all have limited resources to a certain extent. So next, reintegration. What are you doing after a shooting has occurred? What are you doing for perpetrators of a shooting and what are you doing for those affected by it? Um, you know, in addition to preventing violence and responding immediately after it occurs, we have to develop and implement these long range strategies to reintegrate communities, particularly in the context of trauma. Um, so probably the best example of these is hospital-based violence intervention programs. I'm gonna let Mike talk about those in a minute, but just before I do, um, we're really conscious always of talking about the ability to wrap around services for both, uh, for all parties involved in a shooting. Um, you know, these are survivor services, support groups and advocates, and many of these services can be funded by victims of crime assistance funding, and we really encourage you to think about that. Um, we're bringing out a toolkit in the um, coming months as well to try and help jurisdictions to access that funding, it's so critical. Um, we also um, wanted to, I think, highlight just one project out of Birmingham, Alabama for re-entry. Um, that's the Dannon Project, which helps restore lives through providing supportive assistance, and that's short-term training and certifications, job preparation, placements for youth, unemployment, and underemployed youth um, from previously incarcerated families to repair, restore, and renew not only their lives, but the lives of their families through intensive case management referrals. Um, and ideally, these kinds of programs begin early, so not at the point of reintegration, but they begin six months at least before release. And talking specifically about hospital-based programs, uh, these are programs that are embedded in Trauma One centers, okay? Not every hospital has a Trauma One center. Those are centers that are outfitted to deal with fatal as well as non-fatal shootings and other traumatic injury. Um, many communities don't have a Trauma One center at all. Those are considered trauma deserts. In a trauma desert, folks have to go a little bit farther, if not too far, to get medical assistance. So the first step is identifying where your trauma one centers are. Two, it's developing a strategy, and Massachusetts General recently came out with a document that recommends specific questions that medical professionals should utilize when engaging non-fatal shooting victims. But that should be done as soon as that individual comes into your hospital. Why? You have a unique yet small window of opportunity to engage with an individual who has come to you seeking assistance, wanting to tell you about their injury, wanting to get you to help them not be injured and stay out of the life. That's the time to identify how many guns they have, where they live, what community they're in, who they're affiliated with, what other inputs are in their life that you might be able to alter and change their course or their trajectory. A uh, recent analysis in Baltimore has found that individuals who have opted in, because it is a voluntary program in hospitals, right, because they're not under arrest, possibly, at that time, um, but a hospital is not a criminal justice agency. So at the end of the day, they can only offer it to those who opt in. Those who do uh, have experienced anywhere from 39 to an 82% increase in employment opportunities. The variance is dependent on the community they're returning to, the resources that are available to them there. But on the flip side, they found that individuals who have not opted in, who have came into the hospital with a non-fatal injury and then been dismissed, have six times more likely, are six times more likely to be injured by a gun and are four times more likely to be arrested for a felony. So we see the stark 
difference between those who have actually been utilizing these programs versus those who opt out. And it's for that reason that we recommend that folks, one, implement these strategies and utilize them as a part of a comprehensive plan. The final, the fifth uh, limb of this strategy is accountability and transparency. Um, that means we're talking about data transparency, about periodic reviews, um, and also about citizen engagement in transparency. Um, and I know that talking about data collection and data transparency can be difficult. There's a lot of rules to work around. We have a lot of sensitive material as agencies in our hands. Um, but what we really see, of course, is when we see the implementation and the evaluation of projects like this, it uh, allows us to access the evidence to spread this to you in particular. But, in, uh, but further, you know, when agencies are transparent with their data, they empower citizens to do the same, to understand um, risk, to understand what is improving, um, and to really engage with law enforcement agencies in, an, in a truly informed way, rather than one behind a veil of ignorance. Now, I don't just say that about law enforcement agencies, though, and we at Everytown have been doing a lot of work recently to expand our view of transparency to include other agencies, like courts, for instance. We have court monitoring programs, we have volunteers going and watching court cases. Uh, I think I spoke earlier about domestic violence and how we saw those um, you know, pretty dramatic 10% drops in homicide rates when we have domestic violence gun relinquishment laws. And in doing this, we discovered that many of those laws are very poorly implemented when they hit the courts. That you know, laws that might look mandatory aren't applied by judges in that way. Um, and to imagine the, the difference and the, um, you know, the, re the reduction in homicide I might have been able to show you if we had full implementation, of course, is exactly the kind of reason why citizens um, can access this data and should be trying to create this kind of data. Um, and then to go and ask their courts and ask um, law enforcement agencies to help them hold courts accountable as well. So let's talk about some real implementation efforts utilizing some of those strategies or efforts to resource those strategies in states as well as uh, local municipalities. Um, sorry, it looks a little jumbled there, but I'll read you guys through the bottom. Um, but first and foremost, most importantly, GIVE is a national model. Um, and when we travel around this nation advocating for increased resources for state funding initiatives, the first thing I point to um, is GIVE and the work that has been done here in New York State. Uh, we know that between 2010 and 2017, homicide rates throughout the state have plummeted uh, by 41%, 49% between males 14 to 30 years old, and non-fatal shootings between 2017 and 2018 have declined in GIVE, uh, give counties since 2015, um, another 6% just since last year. And that's important to note that not only are all of our GIVE counties focused on stopping gun homicide, but they are also equally focused on the non-fatal shootings. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of shootings do not end in death, but rather in traumatic injury that folks have to deal with for decades and decades. So stopping that um, is another critical point of, of GIVE. There are a number of states that have followed the model. They have done what New York has done, and we've tried to help them do it as well as they can. That includes California. We'll talk a little bit about CalVIP, uh, their violence intervention program, their state funding effort throughout all counties. We'll talk a little bit about Massachusetts, uh, their SSYI program, which has been in effect since 2011. We'll talk a little bit about some of the, the things being done in cities like Seattle, Washington on domestic violence, Jacksonville with Cure Violence, and Washington, D.C., using legislation to resource uh, a local office of gun violence prevention, or rather three offices, um, as well as local gun violence prevention groups. Uh, but beyond GIVE already being a model, they've also added new laws recently. Obviously, earlier today we were talking about the ERPO law, which went into effect on August 24th of this year, and we're working with a number of municipalities to uh, grapple with that but then also domestic violence protective orders, uh, which were added in uh, 2016, 2018 they're effective, um, which changed the gun uh, dispossession component to include handguns. So let's talk about CalVIP. Great, so CalVIP, the California Violence Intervention and Prevention uh, Project, um, supports community-based violence intervention programs that apply a localized approach to address gun violence, and it really focuses on California's hardest-hit neighborhoods. Um, so, of course, funding here is the key, right? In 2017, CalVIP had $9 million in funding. That was a great start, and it funded a lot of very important work. Um, for instance, Oakland Ceasefire, which is a group violence intervention model program, um, 
you know, has been funded by CalVIP, but they've seen a 43% drop in homicides since 2012. Really outstanding early results. Um, but the real uh, shortcoming from our perspective was that this $9 million didn't spread very far across the state of California. So in 2018, there was a big push by nonprofit organizations in particular. Um, and I don't know if Giffords is here, but wanted to give a shout out to them for really leading that charge. Um, it was a big campaign. We had a huge grassroots campaign. Cam campaign. All of our Moms Demand Action volunteers were out there writing letters and showing up to meetings and, and lobbying for this. And we ultimately achieved a budget allocation of $30 million, so a $21 million increase for the state. Um, just one example of the impact of that is that now the San Diego Police Department has been resourced to provide ERPO trainings for state law enforcement, um, sorry, for law enforcement statewide. So taking a program where you know, one city had this excellent regime of training for officers to understand how to use extreme risk orders. Now they'll have the benefits of that statewide, which is really exciting. And then in Massachusetts, we have the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, uh, which has been active since 2011, like I mentioned. It has three main components, uh, the police and community collaboration, employing credible messengers, so that's cure violence, the street outreach work I was talking about earlier and then having a multi-pronged plan to deliver social services. So once you've identified these individuals, you've now engaged the community to do so, how do we make sure that they do not continue on the path? And that's by providing those social services that can assist them with that. They found a number of gains, right? Uh, during the pendency of this program, 18% drop in homicide, 41 amongst boys and men, which was the focus of this initiative. So it was very successful. Additionally, it saved taxpayers money. 735 for every dollar invested, um, and total of eight to 10 million, and we're working with Massachusetts to increase that. We're also starting to strike at those intersectional issues, like I mentioned before, that creates the environment. So we're starting to develop youth works policies with Massachusetts, trying to resource that so that they can continue to employ uh, teens who are subject to uh, the violence in these disproportionately impacted communities. As I mentioned earlier, cities aren't far behind. Um, in Seattle back in 2015, or rather in 2014, they passed their DVRO, DVRO law, their Domestic Violence Relinquishment Order law. Um, in 2015, they realized that although they were being issued, no one was, being, was complying. Only 2% of the folks actually gave in their guns. They wanted to figure out why. They were pushing for an ERPO law, and they wanted to make sure once they got the ERPO law, they had fixed their gaps and would be effective. They created a task force with a retired judge, local law enforcement from a cross-section of agencies. They started appearing at ex parte hearings. They identified a number of gaps, no compliance, no follow-up, no data sharing amongst agencies, no sharing of critical criminal history information at decision points for judges, and they developed a response, an MOU, between those agencies so that they would continue to collaborate, a model policy that determined their process, how they would uh, actually do intake of these cases, and then also how do they serve those firearms, how do they maintain those firearms, um, and other solutions, including dedicated staff in the DA's office, police office, and, and court, so that they could be focused on ERPO compliance throughout um, the year. Jacksonville, I don't know how many people are familiar with what's been happening in Jacksonville this year, uh, but Jacksonville has been dealing with a rash of homicides. The mayor stood up and said, we have to do something. He convened the community. The community called for cure violence. That's the street outreach program that we mentioned earlier. And we worked with the city council to identify, as well as to connect them with cure violence, uh, but then to identify the funds and to resource that effort. And they've been up and running now for about two months. During the time they've been up and running, the two sites they're active in have experienced 25 straight days of no violence. That's not uncommon for cure violence sites because the strategy does work and they do find that there are lulls in the violence, right? But this is very notable, especially following such a rash um, earlier this summer. And then in DC, DC actually passed a law. Back in 09, they had a different version. They had created a GVI working group and a collaborative coordinating council to bring all the different GVP groups to the table to ideate how they could do their job better. Uh, in 2016, they passed the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act, the NEAR Act, uh, commonly called. And it had three prongs. One, uh, developing the implementation oversight infrastructure, the, the one that GIVE does so well, 
um, a, mix, a mixture of a number of agencies, buy-in from the mayor's office, um, contributions from a actually the DCAG as well, who is invested in a street outreach program himself, um, and consistent oversight over their different implementation efforts to make sure they were effective. Second, community policing, as all of you are already engaged in. Engaging with the community, allowing them to inform their procedures and policies, making sure they were victim-centered, making sure they treated people like humans, um, and doing the, the right thing by folks when they engage them, and then data collection. To be truthful, this is the one part of the NEAR Act that they've been struggling with and they're working to implement with better efficacy, but the intent of the law was to make sure that they are capturing the necessary data, analyzing it, and allowing that intel to inform their strategy and resource deployment. Now they have three offices, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, which is basically a hub for all their local gun violence prevention groups. They all receive funding from that office. That office is siloed. Uh, although they do communicate regularly with law enforcement, law enforcement is not a part of their implementation efforts. Separately, they have the Office of Violence Prevention and Health Equity, where they center their public health approach. They treat people like humans, like I said, but they also acknowledge that Crime operates similar to an infectious disease. I didn't give you the history of cure violence, but it started from a doctor, Gary Slutkin, who, an epidemiologist who found that crime spreads from person to person just like tuberculosis does. I may get shot, but my friends and family are also impacted. They may then retaliate. Now someone else's family might retaliate and it spreads. They acknowledge that, and that office focuses on reducing that impact. And lastly, their community crime prevention team. This is a cross-section team of agency folks who actually do the immediate response when violence occurs. These folks are on the ground 24-7. When a shooting happens, they show up. And that's a large part of the strategy in DC. And I will also note, unfortunately, over the last year, their homicide rates have increased. But prior to that, they were experiencing success with this model. So let's talk about how government and NGOs can co-produce public safety. State and local officials can take really significant steps to support law enforcement in protecting public safety by resourcing them effectively, advising their efforts, um, and making sure that their strategies are evidence-based. Non-government organizations also have a really important role to play, um, and we see that in our own work. We see non-government organizations informing government and law enforcement about laws, evidence-based strategies and practices. We see them advocating for the necessary resources to do this work providing tools to assist in the identification and implementation of strategies, and also collaborating with allies in the community to resource local efforts to reduce gun violence. And before we move on, um, and we did talk a little bit about CalVit, but just to do a deeper dive, and I think it's also um, analogous to our efforts in Connecticut where we work very closely with Project Longevity. When we first engaged in California, the first step was to engage with government. And we spoke with Governor Newsom. Newsom was very clear that for him to move the dial on this, he needed to see a cross-section of the GVP community in California asking for the same thing. A large role that Giffords played was bringing the right folks to the table, and not just national partners, local gun violence prevention groups, survivors and victims, additionally, our moms. I don't know how much you guys know about every town, but we have two million moms, and we call them that generously. That includes husbands as well as students of both genders. About 400 of them descended on Sacramento, knocking on doors, demanding the change that they wanted and needed, and ultimately many of the dollars that we were able to achieve in CalVIP of the 30 million will be flowing through law enforcement and otherwise directly to local gun violence prevention groups all of whom are committed and working in concert to reduce the violence. So that's, a, that's one example of the role we as a non-governmental organization play in resourcing you, uh, law enforcement, as well as other government agencies to do the work you're already doing. Yeah, so then more specifically what we're doing, we're, we're calling on attorneys general to develop guidance and training for implementation of new and ambiguous laws. We presented a session earlier today about the new extreme risk protection order law and there were so many questions in the room and 
You know, we know that in other states we've seen some really fantastic outcomes when attorneys general have gone forward and put out publications and guidance documents um, about exactly when and how they expect law enforcement to implement these brand new laws. You know, New York's extremist protection order law has been in effect since August 24, if I'm correct. Um, you know, it's a very short period of time for folks to get ready and to, um, you know, to be, uh, have all their, uh, their guidance in place and their court practices in place. So in New Jersey, the Attorney General put out that type of publication and also in Indiana. We've also been calling on prosecutors to um, develop interagency task forces to monitor and enhance homicide, non-fatal and dispossession cases um, for compliance or enhancement. We've seen some really outstanding results um, when prosecutors have worked with other agencies to try to clear these very particularly difficult cases. Um, Seattle's a great example of that. And we've also been calling on police leadership to prioritize data-informed policing and utilize crime gun and shell tracing platforms in every instance. Um, to, to add on to that, um, what the AG in New Jersey did was he basically broke down the law in a guidance that basically has the force of law, requiring that uh, law enforcement within that state consider the use of ERPO when specific instances were observed. Um, additionally, when we're talking about working with prosecutors, we're engaging with folks that have not or have not implemented some laws, or perhaps the law have not been passed and they're trying to determine what their policy position will be on it because perhaps their governor has asked them for their input. So we work to advise them. Another caveat is frequently they're requesting us to advise them. We're not always out here banging on doors with our moms. In fact, staff does not do that at all. And what we do is we actually look for the folks that want and need our help and we work to assist them in the way they've requested. So then we're also advocating for more resourcing, always. We've been calling on governors to develop state funding programs for gun violence prevention, tailored to the specific people and places driving violence, and to develop interstate task forces to address illegal gun trafficking. <clears throat> we've also been calling on mayors to develop municipal policies to reduce gun violence in cities. And we've seen, for instance, New Orleans really leading the way in that regard. Calling on mayors to pass funding bills to support community-based violence prevention programs, like we were talking about earlier in Jacksonville, um, to advocate for drawing down on victims of crime assistance funding to create um, victim assistance programs. That's federal funding that they receive, um, oh sorry, that states receive and can allocate to specific um, groups of underserved victims. To leverage business and municipal purchasing power to reduce the presence and flow of guns. And also to acquire and centralize firearms technology and data for use by government and the community. And in terms of leveraging that business and purchasing power, Something really exciting that we saw out of New Jersey recently was the uh, passage of an executive order um, specifically directing various state agencies to look into their purchasing practices for firearms, um, for equipment, for st um, state law enforcement, um, and to look at who they were purchasing from, what the circumstances were. Um, also to look at the underwriting of um, you know, really specific things like state and municipal bonds. How is uh, the state's you know, immense purchasing power being used and how can it be used um, to really ensure that, uh, I guess, organizations or companies providing and manufacturing guns for states are complying with basic uh, legal principles. Fortunately, New York State is already a part of an interstate task force, states for gun safety, and once those task forces are created, we then work closely with them um, in concert so that we can help them develop their policy positions. One thing we're working on with them right now is to increase tracing. And then we provide tools. Um, we have a number of reports that we generate and that we put out into the ether. We also provide them directly to folks when they request. Some of our more recent uh, reports are our Nation of Survivors, which is a deep dive into the way survivors across the nation have experienced gun violence. We've spoken with a number of survivors to uh, uh, populate that report. So if you want, go on everytown or everytownresearch.org, you can download it there. Um, we also have Jackie's forthcoming report on DV and guns in Rhode Island, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So um, not only do we try to um, share good news from other research projects, but every town also does its own research. And for a period of around seven months in Rhode Island, we had our um, army of moms volunteers sitting in court watching domestic violence cases and tracking what, for all intents and purposes, was a mandatory firearm relinquishment law. Um, 
under this Rhode Island law, the expectation was any person subject to an order of protection would be required to file a document, an affidavit, stating either that they'd turned in their guns or they didn't have any to turn in in the first place. And we expected to go and do this implementation monitoring project, see something close to 100% compliance, and to move on to the next state. And instead what we found is that judges weren't even making these orders in the first place. You know, something we thought would be 100% compliance looks more like 31% compliance in real life. Um, the court had, hadn't updated its forms. They'd been in checkbox in the past. The court had just kept that checkbox on its forms. We also looked into whether people actually complied with the order. And, you know, to cut a long story short, no, they didn't. Less than half of the defendants complied with the court's order, and there was no follow-up. The court wasn't tracking these cases or finding out what was going to happen next. So that's the kind of um, investigative reporting that we're trying to do to make sure that all the resources and time and effort that community organisations and law enforcement are putting into... Um, you know, bringing domestic abusers to court actually results in the outcomes expected under the legislation. And then, of course, we have another report called VOCA Assistance that will be coming out in November. Another member of my team has been doing a similar qualitative survey um, across the nation, speaking with state administrators of VOCA to see some of their obstacles and struggles in distributing those funds to local gun violence prevention groups separately, L uh, local gun violence prevention groups sharing with us their successes as well as their struggles in drawing those funds down, and when they have drawn them down, what they're able to utilize them for, and then also victims, um, trying to see what their personal experience was like attempting to, to, to attain assistance um, from VOCA. And as everyone knows, um, VOCA is a federal fund. It's distributed to every state. Every state has a state administrator. It flows from the state to government as well as local gun violence prevention groups that fill out uh, a form uh, and it's reviewed by the state and then dispersed. What we found is that the vast majority of money is going unspent um, and that there are many groups that are not getting the funds who need them and should. We also develop fact sheets. These are short form documents that will give you a quick overview of an issue. Most recently, we've put out a report called Gun Violence, or rather a fact sheet called Gun Violence in Cities, which captures much of the opening where we talk about some of the nuanced statistics and factors in cities that make them um, so susceptible to gun violence. Uh, gun violence in America, I gave you the brief overview. The report's a lot better. Um, and also the impact of local violence intervention programs where we talk about a number of the strategies we shared earlier. Um, and then also web tools. Right now we have a gun law navigator where you can go on, you can see what gun laws are available in each state. You can play with it and add different factors to find the information you care about. It's very informative um, and flush with information. Uh, my team is currently working on a new website which should go live in another month or so. It's called City Grip. Uh, GRIP stands for Gun Violence Reduction Insight Portal. Um, much of what we do is qualitative on my team. We're in the field, we're talking to folks like yourselves, we're learning. For this specific project, we ask mayors, police chiefs, and sheriffs, what are your most innovative yet successful data-informed strategies you're implementing right now? We then created a website where you will be able to go on and alter six different jurisdiction inputs your population level, the types of violence you're concerned with, whether your city is proficient in data, whether your crime is clustered, and it will auto-populate strategies based on those inputs you've inserted based on our conversations in similar communities with strategies that you should be considering for implementation in your city. It's gonna be a powerful tool once that populates, you'll be able to click through to each strategy, which will show the proper way to approach that strategy, necessary resources, local partners, local impact, as well as contact information for that um, sourcing agency. Separately, you'll then be, click, be able to click through to case studies for specific communities, and we've worked very hard and are continuing to work hard to make sure that we have diverse jurisdictions. So we have a rural county, Clackamas, that we're featuring. Clackamas adjoins Multnomah. Multnomah is where Portland is in Oregon. Um, but we have Clackamas, we have Philadelphia, we have uh, Denver, and we're working on Charleston. So we're making sure that no matter where you're from, you'll be able to go on that website. And whether or not there's a case study for a community like yours, you'll be able to define your community in those inputs and find strategies for communities like yours. And then of course we have Every Stat. Every Stat is another website we're working on. We have a lot going on. Um, just to let you know, we have 180 people in our whole agency. Um, many of which aren't even in our New York office, a lot of whom work remote. And then we got two million moms 
and they're like our major audience, and you can only imagine what that's like, but we're, we're getting it done. Every stat is another website which has all of the statistics that we rely on in presentations like this, in those different reports, those different fact sheets, those different web tools, and you'll be able to find the necessary stats that you need for your community, for the type of violence you're concerned with. Um, and then lastly, and I prefer this anyway, custom solutions. I much prefer when a governor, an attorney general, a police chief, um, a, a state uh, agency uh, employee reaches out and says, hey, this is the problem we're dealing with in this city. What should we do? We immediately do a profile of that city. We do a deep dive into the crime trends over the last three to five years. We identify what strategies are being implemented there. We look at the local gun violence prevention groups that are active, the strategies they're implementing, and we do a gap analysis. We then engage to identify what they can do moving forward, and we work with them to identify the proper resources. And then hopefully they're successful, but we stay in contact. And as things move on, if they need to elevate and perhaps go after a legislative fix, we have a team of folks who can engage with them on that as well. So this is how we uh, so support and resource all of you. This is how we partner with community. Yeah, so we partner with local gun violence prevention groups to try to advance the strategies that they have perfected. And last year, for the very first time, we launched a city gun violence prevention grant program to support 11 local gun violence prevention groups who were implementing evidence-based strategies in places where they were underfunded uh, throughout the US, a real diversity of jurisdictions. Um, so that, in practice, that looked like $100,000 per grantee a year in which to spend it. Um, and a really conscious effort also not to put too many strings on that, to really allow folks to use that for, to pitch to us what they needed the money for and then to use it appropriately. Um, yeah, please. Oh, only caveat is that we made sure that they were implementing an evidence-based strategy. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, similar with the City Grip website, we made sure we were in diverse locations. And another note, we started out with 10. After the Tree of Life shooting, we prioritized adding a location in, in Pittsburgh. And we did that within a couple weeks, and we also were able to increase the total amount. And next year, we are going to double the amount of groups that we're supporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think you know, the main thing to add to that is aside from partnering with our allies, advocating for more funding, we also work to convene local gun violence prevention groups to bring them together to, um, to strategize, to share successes and challenges. Um, and I'll hand over to Mike to talk a little more about our convening this year. Yes, we, uh, yeah, so we were in Hampton, Virginia um, in August. We brought all of our uh, grantees together as well as some academics from Temple to talk about narrative, um, development to make them more successful when they're writing their grants, trying to draw down funds. Talked about data, data monitoring and tracking. We worked with them um, on identifying locations as well as offenders to target. Um, it was a great day, about 50 or so attended and we're looking to do that more regularly in the future. And of course, we partner with our allies. I need not repeat it again. Like I mentioned a number of times, we work very closely with our national partners, Giffords, the Joyce Foundation, as well as um, local gun violence prevention groups in the communities we impact. We do not go into a community at, until we've engaged with the locals, those being the groups that are active, as well as the community members living through the violence. So law enforcement. Here's a couple things that we'd like to leave you with. Um, these are some things that we believe everyone could and should be doing. Um, one is regularly and systematically develop and review your data. I know all of you as give jurisdictions are required to do so. Um, and that's one of the great things that we've been trying to move to other states. A lot of states just want to cut a check. They're not prescribing the strategies. They're not following up to make sure they're effective. It's that oversight that allows us to be as effective as we are here in New York. Um, follow the data and continue to enforce the laws, but also implement the strategies. It has to be a comprehensive approach. I know a lot of times when law enforcement think about community engagement uh, strategies, they think about barbecues and things of that nature, and those are great starting points to first engage, but there are also evidence-based strategies that will also lead to reducing the violence that you should also consider, one of which is a victim assistance program, because we know hurt people hurt people. And if you can provide a victim assistance program to remove people from that life, that's one of the best ways to do it. I'll point out East St. Louis. East St. Louis, Illinois, does not have the highest aggregate gun homicide, but they have the highest gun homicide rate in the nation. They have one VOCA recipient. It's, the East, uh, it's their local county DA. 
that DA has to invest in the community. They have to invest in victim assistance programs. They have to redistribute those funds to those local gun violence prevention groups who are able to respond to the violence in a quick and immediate manner. Yeah, we also ask that you advocate for local ordinances and support state legislation that resources your work and that removes firearms from prohibited individuals and de uh, decreases the flow of illegally trafficked guns. We know, as um, often as lobbyists and as advocates, the power of law enforcement voices um, and really ask that you um, join that fight where it's appropriate to make sure that you're well resourced in that work. Um, we also really encourage advancing and refining policies and procedures to quicken the removal of firearms and reduce suicide. You know, we don't often talk about suicide in this context, but we know that it makes up around two thirds of the gun deaths in America every day. And implement comprehensive and consistent crime gun tracing. As I mentioned earlier, it is a critical part of the story of a firearm. It may not necessarily identify the last possessor, but the last known retail purchaser might have information that can lead you to him. And it's important that you develop that, even in instances of suicide. And I know that many PDs um, struggle with whether or not to trace a gun, but that gun is, is important. It could be connected to another crime. Use the courts to dispossess. Um, also advise them. You know, working with them to develop those documents, those, the paperwork, as we were talking about earlier, there are some courts that have not of course, in other states. But that is an instance that is uh, relevant in a number of small localities where perhaps they've tailored their documents or would prefer to. Take that next step. Work proactively with your court to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then, of course, engage with other states and cities. As we shared today, we're not the only ones doing this. There are lessons to be learned. Um, we're focused on the 17 counties with the most part one crime, California. They're actually all over their state. They also support training by locals for the entire state. They decentralize things a little bit differently. Every state does it a little different. And it's important that we take those lessons and incorporate and integrate them when possible. Questions? I guess that was clear. Yeah. Okay, let me just give you a mic so we can record it. Yeah, just a, just a short question. Um, regarding uh, those web tools, uh, City Grip and um, EveryStat, do you have an a estimated timeline as to when they'll, they'll be made live on your website? Before Thanksgiving, if not sooner. All right, thank you. The DV report, end of this month, Vocal report next month as well. Um, so you were talking about a questionnaire from Mass General for people who come in who are victims of gun violence. Is that public domain or is that? Yes, they did share it publicly. Okay. And it came out in June, early June, if you want to take a look for it. Um, or you can give me your card. I'm right back here with you all, so come on. Well, thank you all again. Um, and feel free to reach out to myself or Jackie. I'll be up here with a couple cards if you need them. And uh, thank you for staying till 430. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Michael and Jackie. And this is the last session for today. We are back here tomorrow for two very...